I got to take my coat off because now we're going to get to work. So, um, just a brief comment uh, because uh, not only um, did you ask a wonderful question yesterday, but I've had other people ask similar questions. And um, uh, again, my, my basic approach is letting Scripture interpret Scripture. And the way I practically do that is not only by looking at quotations, but allusions. But once you talk about allusions, some feel, well, we're, we're getting a little difficult here. The quotations are clear. How do you know something is an illusion? And again, an illusion is something where you have a unique combination of words. In the New Testament passage, it can only be found in one, maybe two or so passages in the Old Testament. So it's uniqueness of wording and uniqueness of theme, how that wording functions in, uh, in, in the theme. Sometimes it may be hard to show that this is an illusion to a probable extent. You, may, you just have to sometimes say what's possible. I think most of the time you can say, yeah, this is probably an illusion. And you can you do this as pastors and people uh, teaching Bible studies. Use the margins of your Bible. Sometimes they only give general parallels, but sometimes they're very specific illusions. And I think this is, this is going to open up a whole world. A lot of Christians don't, and teachers and leaders, pastors, don't make use of these, these uh, illusions that they find in the margins of their Bibles. And it's one of the best ways, practically, to let Scripture interpret Scripture. It takes a little rigor. It takes a little time in the, in the study. And I think one of the best ways, and I, I don't want to be um, to uh, uh, sound like a Gnostic elitist or anything, but if you don't know Greek, uh, first of all, learn it. But um, if you don't know Greek at this point, probably it's likely you're not going to take a year or two out to learn it. But buy a Greek New Testament. Now, why would I tell you to do that? The reason is, is because the Greek New Testament, that's called the Nesalalon 28th edition. If you buy that, don't worry about reading the Greek. But the margins are amazing. They're unbelievable. And so don't let the Greek put you out. Just don't look at the Greek. Just look at the verse number and the margins. This is probably one of the most reliable uh, New Testaments uh, that gives you these, these uh, uh, illusions in the margin. And so um, I think this is very, very important. And so this is my method, uh, but basically detecting illusions. And if you read my larger commentary, even the shorter one, you'll, you'll see that, that method. And uh, sometimes in Revelation, you may have... Four or five illusions in one verse. That's why they don't quote. That's why John does not quote. There's more Old Testament in Revelation than, than in the other books, but fewer quotations. Why? Because he's ramming a lot of it, uh, a lot of illusions, sometimes into even one verse. You might have three or four. And, and, and yesterday, your fine question was, was very uh, excellent, and I, um, uh, I hadn't investigated that passage, but I went back and did and, and, and investigated, and, and there are three words in common with uh, Revelation 17. Um, but Revelation 17 is basically, uh, is it possible that John could be alluding back to, to Esther there? Um, well, I don't think in chapter 17 and verse 4 he's alluding to any Old Testament text myself. Uh, what he's doing is contrasting the whore with the bride, both of which are also cities. And so what he's doing is doing an abbreviation of the jewels that describes the bride in chapter 21. He's doing an, an anticipated antithesis there. And, uh, and so that, that's the first link, that 17.4 is, is really an abbreviation of the jewels of the bride and, and, and showing that this is the antithesis to the bride. Then, of course, when you go to uh, Revelation 21, the, the bride uh, in the city... Uh, the foundations are decorated with 12 jewels. Well, those 12, there are 12 jewels in Exodus 28 for the high priest's um, uh, uh, ephod. And um, likewise in Ezekiel 28, which describes Adam as, as a high priest. And so that's why I think to, to some degree you can see Babylon as kind of a fake uh, imitation high priest. So I just wanted to explain John's first of all trying to compare and contrast with things within the book of Revelation. I don't, I don't think 17.4 is going back to any particular. So I, I only say that because I, I, I hope I didn't leave the impression that I thought he was alluding back to the Old Testament at that point. But it was very interesting, and thank you for, for that. The, what, the, the delight I have in teaching graduate students and in speaking to pastors' conferences is people are serious about the Scriptures. And the only reason I, I bring this up is such an excellent question, and also other people have asked the question. I really want to address it because I'm convinced if you're rigorous about letting Scripture interpret Scripture, this is the practical way to do it. 
Look at the allusions, not just the quotations. Um, also, someone came up yesterday and asked me about First John and uh, why we shouldn't pray about people who have sinned the sin unto death. But come up and see me afterwards. I've reflected a little bit more uh, on that. I, I gave an answer, but uh, I've reflected a little more on that. And by the way, you'll notice this ministry in the last days. I wish I had enough time to give a whole message on already and not yet eschatology. But uh, the last days are not just ahead of us. We are in the last days, uh, as Acts 2 says. In these last days, God has poured forth his spirit. In 1 Corinthians 10, we are those upon whom the ends of the ages have come. 1 John 2, uh, uh, um, 17, it is the last hour, my little children. Just you've heard that Antichrist is coming. I tell you, many Antichrists have already come from this. We know it is the last hour. So we're living in the latter days. So I love that uh, title for the conference, but don't think that that refers to something just future. We're in the midst of the fulfillment of the eschatological prophecies of the Old Testament. Well, now to our text. Um, A number of years ago, my sister-in-law bore a stillborn baby, and we were talking long distance over the phone a few nights later, and she asked me uh, what should her response be to the loss of her child obviously intensely upset, and before I could answer very much, she went on to explain the way she felt like responding. She said, I know I'm saved, and I'll be with God in eternity, uh, but how am I supposed to live each day now until eternity? I was brought up believing that if you have, uh, you get married, you have children, you, can, you should have the expectation that they're going to grow up, and, and uh, you're going to die uh, um, before them, but now my little baby girl is gone, And I have no guarantee that God will not take my other children away from me and my husband away from me. Uh, It was like she felt like a duck in a a shooting uh, gallery. And uh, when am I going to get hit or someone else in my family? And so why shouldn't we fear greatly? Why shouldn't I just be paralyzed by fear every day? It's already happened to me with my little baby girl. And uh, so why shouldn't such fear paralyze us in various other ways? whether it's a terminal illness or fear of a terminal illness. Um, And there were people living in Asia Minor in the first century to which John was writing who were suffering persecution for their witness. And they had plenty to fear. When would they or someone in their family uh, be taken to jail, as we'll see, uh, or even suffer death? They may have been assured of their eternal salvation, but they had to think practically every day, what's going to happen to me uh, in my livelihood? Will I lose my job? Etc. Uh, Revelation 2, 9 through 10 really shows uh, that this is a real live um, uh, situation. If you notice the letter to Smyrna there in chapter 2 of the book of Revelation beginning at verse 8. And the angel of the church in Smyrna uh, uh, write, The first and the last who was dead and has come to life says this, I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich and the blasphemy by those who say they are Jews or not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you're about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful unto death. I'll give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes, that is, does not compromise and suffers imprisonment, even death, that's called overcoming, winning a victory. It's an ironic victory, victory of your faith, shall not be hurt by the second death. So, And we know in the next letter, uh, actually, uh, well, the following uh, um, letter in Thyatira, there is this faithful witness called Antipas. And um, actually, that's in Pergamum. And uh, he's been martyred already. So we know that this was a fear. There are plenty of things that can paralyze us. And so uh, what we want to do is look at our passage. Uh, Believe it or not, uh, I think this passage speaks to the issues of fear of death uh, that can paralyze us in various ways. And uh, in, in, in giving us a beginning answer to this, chapter 11, if you have your Bibles open to that, I think the beginning answer to the questions we've raised here about uh, the fear of death paralyzing us, fear of other things paralyzing us in our spiritual life, uh, the beginning answer is, is given to us in Revelation chapter um, 11. And let me get my pointer here. Um, yeah. uh, and it was given me a measuring rod like a staff and <laughs> that's wonderful. Other direction. Okay. 
uh, rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship in it. And leave, the, leave out the court which is outside the temple and do not measure it, for it has been given to the nations, and they will tread underfoot the holy city for 42 months. And uh, so what is this passage saying? Well, I'm going to give you my summary. I'm not sure you're going to believe it, but then I'm going to try to demonstrate what my summary says. Here's my summary. The beginning answer is God's presence with us now protects us spiritually through suffering. You look at that you say, really? Wow. God's presence now protects us spiritually through suffering. And um, now I'm going to have you get up and explain this to us, okay? <laughs> or any, any volunteers. No, I'll try to do it. Um, the first thing we want to look at, there, there are a lot of interpretations of the temple in this passage. Some see it as the temple, a literal temple in the future that's going to be built in Jerusalem that's not yet built. Some see it actually very intriguingly, and not, not as many of us are aware of this, but the, a description of the temple in 70 A.D. that was going to be uh, destroyed but was still existing at the time. Uh, that's a very unusual interpretation, and uh, the interpretation that it's a future literal temple is probably more likely uh, given uh, b- between those two interpretations, but both hold to a physical temple. Uh, I don't think a physical temple is in mind here, and I want to give the reason for it. And my reason is this. Let Scripture interpret Scripture. So what am I going to do with that? Look at that phrase there. That was given me a measuring rod like a staff. Someone said, rise and measure the temple of God. One of the best things you can have in your study is a concordance. And you, uh, uh, we're not now dealing specifically with allusions to the Old Testament here, though I think there is one, but I think we're now dealing with, let's see, how does the New Testament and then John used temple of God. And if we can understand that full phrase, then maybe we can get a handle on what it means here. Does it typically describe a physical temple that's literal or a spiritual temple? And by the way, we need to be careful about the term literal. Spiritual uh, uh, things are literal. I mean, if our spiritual life isn't literal, then we're dead, if I can put it that way. Um, so uh, we have to be careful about that. By literal, I mean that when you look at a description in the Bible, that people take it to correspond with something physical. Okay, that's what I mean by literal. Though ultimately, uh, I I think we should change the definition of literal. What did the biblical author intend? That's what is literal. But at any rate, um, uh, it's misused in in our culture, I think, in many circles. Now, in the New Testament, the temple, and the phrase temple of God, is never a physical temple. Temple. And so I I want to try to explain that. The phrase temple of God is used ten times in the New Testament. The first time is in Matthew 26, 61, where the false witness uh, against Jesus says he he was able to, he he could uh, uh, tear down the temple of God. That's what they say about Jesus. Uh, What's temple of God mean there? They understood it as a very physical temple. But in John 2, where you have Jesus' words, He doesn't say, I will tear down the temple. He says, you tear down the temple. I will raise it up in three days. So that's why they're a false witness. Uh, They they, they change the uh, person who's going to tear down the temple. It wasn't Jesus, it was uh, the Jews. And furthermore, I don't think Jesus is talking about a physical temple in John 2, the temple of his body. And I think, tear down this temple and I'll raise it. I think he's talking about tearing himself down. He'd begun to be the end time temple in his ministry. You can't keep a good temple man down. He pops right back up in resurrection. And as we identify with him, we uh, become part of that temple. So even in Matthew 23, 16, this is not to be understood as a literal temple of God. It's Jesus in this particular case, as John 2 tells us. And, And then we find a number of times Among the other ten times, listen to the language of Paul here in 1 Corinthians 3, 16. Do you not know that uh, you are the temple of God, the naos theu? If anyone destroys the temple of God, God will destroy him. Again, temple of God in verse 17. In the second part of verse 17, for the temple of God is holy. 2 Corinthians 6, 16. And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. None of those are physical temples. It's the people of God or Jesus who is the temple. 2 Corinthians 2, 4. The Antichrist will take his stand in the temple of God. Now, some take that as a very 
uh, physical temple. I've written a commentary on Thessalonians. I'll let you look at that. I don't think it's a physical temple. Um, I think it's uh, the community of faith, the visible church that the Antichrist comes into at the end of time. Then look with me in Revelation 3. We have again the phrase temple of God. In chapter 3 and verse 12. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he will not go out from it anymore, and I'll write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God and my new name. So what's going on here? I'll make him a pillar in the temple of my God if he, if he overcomes. Here it's uh, talking, uh, especially focusing on the consummation. And at the very end time, believers will become pillars in the temple of God. They'll become part of the temple. What does that mean? We'll, we'll be like Lot's wife in a positive sense. We'll become petrified pillars and we're literally part of a physical temple in the, in the new heavens. Of course not. No, this is saying that we're going to be an integral part of dwelling in God's temple at the end of time. Here we are right in the book of Revelation with this phrase, temple of God. And that occurs two more times, once in our passage and once at the end of our passage. If you notice chapter 11 and verse 19, the temple of God, which is in heaven. It's obviously not the literal temple. This is a heavenly temple. In fact, 14 of the 15 uses of temple refer to the heavenly temple in the book of Revelation. I wish we could just take time out just to look at nothing but those. But we don't have that kind of time. Um, and so the temple of God in verse 19, which is in heaven, was opened. The ark of his covenant appeared in his temple. There were flashes, lightning, sounds, peals of thunder, and an earthquake, and a great hailstorm. Judgment will come from the temple of God at the very end of time. So could our passage in chapter 11 and verse 1 be a physical temple? Well, all things are possible, but not all things are probable. In the light of all the other uses in the New Testament and in the book of Revelation, it's likely that this is not a physical temple uh, on earth, but a temple uh, of God, God's spirit dwelling with his people. So um, I think it's very important then to see that. By the way, the only time where it doesn't refer to a heavenly uh, temple in the book of Revelation, remember I said about 14 of the 15 uses refer to a heavenly temple. Listen to the only time it doesn't. It's referring to the temple in the new heavens and earth. And in chapter uh, 21 and in verse 22, city, uh, uh, I saw no temple in the new heavens and earth, for the Lord God, the Almighty, the Lamb are its temple. Now some have taken that to mean, well, there's no temple in the new heavens and earth. No, that's not what the text is saying. There's a temple. But it's not going to be a physical temple. There's no physical temple like there was in the old heavens and earth because God and the Lamb are the temple. And we've already seen, of course, that Jesus was the temple, haven't we, uh, in John chapter 2. So um, uh, that's also a very important passage then. So the temple symbolizes God's people in chapter 11 and verse 1, among which God dwells. And this this makes sense, doesn't it? Because already we've been told that one of the most important features of the temple, the lampstands in chapter 1, that they're the church. And so already the church has been identified right now here on earth with the temple. And uh, by the way, some would say, is this text exclusively future? I think it's already and not yet. in, in that sense, I think it's, it's describing something already going on and will be consummated in the future. Um, I'm not going to take a great deal of time to talk about why. I, if you want to ask questions later, I'd be happy to do that. But whether it's future or present, uh, it's talking about God dwelling with his people. And I think it's the heavenly temple that has come down to dwell with God's people on earth. I think it is God's people on earth that are in mind here in chapter 11 and in verse 1. Notice it also talks about the altar there. And uh, there's given me a measuring rod like a staff. And someone said, rise and measure the temple of God and the altar. Now, the altar is very important. How are we to understand that? We've already seen that the, because of usage, letting the Bible interpret the Bible, the temple is not a physical temple in the way that people picture it. And how about the altar? Well, the best way to understand it is to let the book of Revelation explain it. Let Scripture interpret Scripture. Look at chapter 6 and verse 9. And when he broke the fifth seal, I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and because of the testimony which they had maintained. 
So this, this passage shows that Christians worship in the temple as priests who offer themselves as sacrifices on the altar of the gospel. So this is their worship, in other words, here in this passage. It's explained by chapter 6 and verse 9. What's their worship? They sat their priests, and they're not offering animal sacrifices. They're offering themselves, and that's their worship in the temple. And it goes on to say, and those who worship in it. How do they do that? Well, it's integrally related to uh, worship around the altar. Indeed, uh, believers have already been called priests. Remember chapter 1 and verse 6, they're a kingdom and priests. It's repeated in chapter 5 and verse 10, kingdom of priests. And uh, so we're Christians as priests who serve in God's temple. Um, now, our picture in chapter 11, verses 1 through 2, is an unusual picture of Christians as both part of a temple and priests in it. It's very similar to 1 Peter 2, 5, quote, you also as living stones are being built up as a spiritual house, temple for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And by the way, if you read on in 1 Peter there in chapter 2, uh, it talks about uh, how priests have a mission to proclaim the excellencies of God throughout the world. And we're going to find here there's a mission out into the world as well. Uh, priests are mediators between God and, uh, and humans. And uh, essentially all of us are priests. And we have, we have that commission to be mediators to those in a dark world. And our light, as we'll see, is uh, the lampstand. We are lampstands. We'll talk about what that means as well. <clears throat> Even the city. Notice chapter 11 and verse 2 uh, also talks about the city here. Uh, leave out the court which is outside the temple. Do not measure it, for it has been given to the nations. They'll tread underfoot the holy city for two months. Um, already we found back in chapter 3 and verse 12 that not only are believers a, um, um, a temple, but they're a city. And uh, probably this trampling the city is trampling the saints of God if we're going to let Scripture interpret Scripture. Again, it's always possible we have an unusual use, but I think it's safest to let the Scripture interpret the Scripture. Um, So we should expect that the temple, altar, and even the city are symbolic. Why should we expect that? Because of chapter 1 and verse 1. I don't need to say any more, hopefully, because I said, at least I can't say any more. I tried to explain that yesterday that the programmatic verse says that this is a symbolic communication. We should expect uh, symbols. And so this is nothing new here in that regard. So the temple, the altar, and the city generally symbolize we who are Christians. We're part of the spiritual temple of God. But why are we said to be part of a temple and worshiping at its altar? Well, of course, the temple represents God's presence, as I've mentioned, among his people. Since the temple was the place in the Old Testament where God dwelt among his people. Now we're the unique dwelling of God on earth. I mentioned that the altar symbolizes really the call of the church. And what what is that call of the church? To suffer for its witness. That's the norm. It's You might call it a cruciform witness. In the Old Testament, the altar was also in God's presence and animals were sacrificed on the temple altar. Now we Christians sacrifice ourselves on the spiritual altar in God's spiritual temple by suffering for our faith in Christ. This is how we worship in the midst of the temple. And this is nothing more than Pauline, right? Romans 12, 1. Present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice acceptable acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. So the reason we're said to be a temple... And worshiping at its altar is to stress that God's presence continually abides with his people. Because that's what the temple is all about, God's presence. So what does it mean that they're measured, however? Remember in verse 1 it says that they are uh, measured. Um, There was given me a measuring rod like a staff. Someone said, rise and measure. What's the point of the measuring Well, I think it means that God is spiritually, he's guaranteeing the spiritual protection of his people. He's guaranteeing his presence will not be taken away from his people. 
He's guaranteeing our salvation. Another way of saying it, what is salvation but the life-giving presence of God that, that regenerates us and we continue to grow in until we come to consummate physical and uh, spiritual resurrection uh, in Christ at the end of the age. In fact, chapter 21, the end of the book, verses 15 to 17, right before the great jewel passage that we talked about yesterday and earlier this morning, there uh, the new Jerusalem is identified as the people of God and the new creation within the broad context. And uh, there it says that John is measuring uh, the walls and uh, the height and the width. He's measuring it because in the new heavens and earth, nothing can harm the people of God. It's an absolute guarantee that in the new heavens and earth for eternity, God's people will be secure. And that's what it means in our passage. And in both passages, in chapter 21 and in chapter 11 here in verses, verse 1, this measuring comes out of Ezekiel, chapters 40 to 48, where 40 times either the verb to measure or the noun is used, and it's the same thing. This is talking about an end-time temple that will be absolutely inviolable, that, that uh, cannot be harmed. Now, that's a very tough vision there. I wish I could take a whole hour to talk on that vision. I do have a whole chapter on it in my temple book, and so I'm going to have to footnote that at this point. But John uh, alludes to that vision massively in chapter 21. He sees the fulfillment of that vision in God dwelling with his people in the new heavens and the new earth. But notice that we saw, of course, in chapter uh, 11 and verse 2, leave out the court, which is outside the temple. Don't measure it, for it has been given to the nations. What's going on there? Well, uh, some believe, we take this literally, that there are some uh, Jews or Jewish Christians who are secured within uh, the inner part of the temple, but others who are outside are physically harmed. Um, Again, I don't take a literal approach, a physical approach in this regard. So this could mean, uh, according to the way I'm approaching it, one of two things. Could this be uh, that it's it's pseudo-Christians? They're not measured. Could the outer court be those who aren't really Christians but part of the visible church, if you will? Um, I don't think so for myself. Um, I think that it refers to the physical side of the church that is not measured. God does not guarantee our physical, material well-being in this world. The court symbolizes the true church during the church age, as does the inner temple, the inner part, but it represents the physical part. And um, and, and notice, not only was there an altar in, in, in the holy place, but out, outside there was an altar where animals were slain in, in the outer court. And I think this represents that it's in the outer court. We go out into the world and we sacrifice ourselves. Uh, we're, we're priests sacrificing ourselves. And there we, 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 we talked about the altar uh, just a few minutes ago. Um, now, Suffering is described further in the last part of verse 2 where it says that our suffering will last for how many years? Well, 42 months, three and a half years. This is a symbolic time of tribulation which extends from Christ's first coming to his last coming. Uh, And and by the way, the idea of the great tribulation, yes, I do believe there's going to be a a very intense tribulation uh, at the end of time, but it has been inaugurated. And uh, 1 John 2 uh, 17 is clear on that. My little children, it's the last hour. Just as you've heard that Antichrist is coming. I tell you, many Antichrists have already come. From this, we know it's the last hour. Eschatology, the eschatological tribulation, the coming of the Antichrist had already occurred and was ongoing. It's going to get, just, it's going to get worse. And so um, this, this notion then of tribulation is, is already and not yet. Uh, a lot of people see the three and a half years as something way in the future. And I just want to make a comment on that. I take the three and a half years to be the church age. Now, why would I do that? Well, because of chapter 12 and verses 1 to 6. So just parenthetically, let's look at that so I can give a particular reason for the temporal hope that's in me uh, in this regard. In chapter 12, in verse 1, a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. She was with child, cried out, being in labor and pain to give birth. 
This is the Messianic community. Another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon having seven heads, ten horns, and on his heads were seven diadems. And his tail swept away a third of the stars of heaven, threw them to the earth. The dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she gave birth, he might devour her child. Probably uh, in history, this would be Herod's attempt to kill Jesus. And verse 5, she gave birth to a son, a male child, who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. Her child was caught up to God and to his throne. Well, that's a quick snapshot of the birth and life of Jesus. Uh, can't get much quicker and, and briefer than that. His purpose, though, uh, is, is otherwise. Uh, in verse 6, the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God so that she might be nourished for 1,260 days, three and a half years. Now, those who take an exclusively future view of uh, uh, our passage in chapter 11 and generally of the book of Revelation, who say the three and a half years are yet to come, they're, they're a part of the tribulation, some say half of the latter day tribulation at the very end before the coming of Christ, um, they see a big valley between verse 5 and verse 6. So remember verse 5? The, resur- the resurrection and ascension. Then verse 6, the woman fled into the wilderness. They say that this is Israel back on earth after the rapture of the church and uh, uh, for their three and a half years, right before the coming of Jesus Christ. So they, they posit this huge multi-thousand-year valley between verse 5 and verse 6. It's possible um, if, if you hold to the whole scheme of what is called dispensational premillennialism, which I'd like to give an hour of a lecture on, but I'm sorry, I cannot do. Um, I just take verse 6, falling right on the heels of verse 5. After the resurrection, the woman, who is the covenant community, continues to exist, and it's three and a half years. It's the church age. And so uh, uh, that's why one reason I take our passage, not just as exclusively future, but already and not yet. It's the church age that has begun, it's ongoing, and, and will be consummated in the future. I'm letting Revelation interpret Revelation at that point, though, of course, it's a debated text, as I have mentioned. Now, what are we saying then about our first two verses? God's presence with us protects us spiritually through suffering. This is the main point of verses 1 to 2. He does not promise to bless us materially or physically. The health and wealth gospel is not something that is in the book of Revelation or, in, in my opinion, in the Bible. Though I do ultimately believe in the health and wealth gospel, there's nothing healthier than the final resurrection of our bodies in the new heavens and a new earth. That there is a true sense of the health and wealth gospel. But this requires an eternal perspective. What we do here for God does not help us to live more comfortably in a physical way. When we're faithful in our witness, we sometimes suffer in various ways from those who reject our witness. Now this idea that that we're looking at in verses 1 through 2 apparently had an impact on a man named Polycarp, one of its original readers. Polycarp was probably a member and maybe even an elder of the church at Smyrna at the time John wrote this letter. It's amazing. And He was a pupil of John. He died a martyr's death. This leader was burned at the stake in 155 A.D. He'd been asked to say Caesar is Lord, but refused. And so he was brought to the stadium, and uh, the proconsul, the Roman proconsul, said, uh, uh, curse uh, Christ and uh, and swear uh, by Caesar, and I'll let you go. No problem, but reproach Christ. Polycarp said, 86 years I've served him and he never did me any injury. How can I blaspheme my king and savior? And the Roman council pressed him again. And he said, swear by the fortune of Caesar. And um, Polycarp said, do you not know who I am? Uh, Let me tell you again, I'm a Christian and I trust in Christ. The Roman council said, I have wild beasts at hand. I'll throw you to those unless you change your mind. Polycarp said, um, uh, no, I will not reproach Christ. And then he said to Polycarp, I'll cause you to be consumed by fire since you aren't afraid of beasts. Polycarp still wouldn't change. He said, you threaten me with fire which burns for an hour and after a little is extinguished, but you are ignorant of the fire of the coming judgment and of eternal punishment reserved for the ungodly. But why do you delay? Bring forth what you will. And soon afterward, he was burned at the stake. Now, what could give him such confidence? Um, that he could 
withstand uh, such threats and ultimate punishment. I think it's the fact that he knew God was dwelling with him right there and then and that that really was propelling him to have such boldness. He had an eternal perspective that motivated to him, uh, him to endure momentary affliction. It inspired him not to become so depressed. It's not wrong to be sad about death. It means separation from loved ones. But in the midst of such temporary sadness, we can have ultimate hope that we will be reunited with our believing sisters and brothers. Being faithful through suffering in our witness is more than being willing to suffer from people who reject their testimony. The invisible powers of darkness can bring suffering upon us for no apparent reason. And a bad response to that can be a bad witness. A good response can be an effective witness. Um, So verses 1 through 2 have emphasized God's presence with us, protects us spiritually through suffering. But why does God want us to be assured of his presence that protects us through suffering? Verses 3 to 4 tell us why God wants us to be assured of his presence through suffering. Look again now at verses 3 to 4. And I will grant authority to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1260 days, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. And we get the uh, three and a half years again. What is this saying here? Well, the point is this. God's presence with us protects us through suffering. Why? To empower our witness. It's not just for our welfare. It's ultimately for him to empower our witness to him. And that's the point of verses 3 to 4. He wants us to be assured of his protecting presence in the midst of our physical suffering so that we'll have confidence that gives us boldness, as boldness was given to Polycarp. This is our priestly sacrifice in the holy place, in the courtyard of the world. Our very faithful response to God in suffering is a witness in itself to the hopeless world, which loses hope when it suffers death and other severe things. So verses 3 through 7, actually, not just 3 to 4, tell us what God's presence with us will lead to. God's presence with us protects us spiritually through suffering to give us boldness, confidence in witness. Now, here we come to another problem. We come to these two witnesses. Are we to take them as physical individuals, two individual prophets? Many do. Um, Probably if we had sat in a circle in little groups, all of us would have different views of of this passage perhaps. And uh, some of you are exercising probably great patience in listening to me. Um, But uh, some take it as Elijah and Enoch or, or Enoch and Moses or Elijah and Moses who will come on the earth at the end of time. Even some take it as Peter and Paul. Um... I don't think that they are physical, just two individuals. Let's let Revelation interpret Revelation again. How does that help us? Well, look at verse 4. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. Now, when you have a clear... Remember some of the symbols are clearly explained to us in uh, the book of Revelation? Not, not, Not a lot of them, but some are. And if we get that image again John doesn't have to keep explaining it he's already explained the lampstands and who are they they're the church remember the lampstands the seven lampstands in chapter 1 and verse 20 and and onwards the lampstands it's the corporate church but someone will say no it must be individuals because look they're two they're not seven they were seven back there in chapters 1 to 3 yeah but remember there were only two faithful churches Smyrna in Philadelphia. This is the faithful remnant church that is the witness, not the compromising church. And so letting Scripture interpret Scripture, uh, this is the witnessing church. But we made quite a point of how verses 1 through 2 is about the temple and God's presence with us, uh, uh, dwelling with us. How does that relate to verses 3 to 4? Well, it's it's very uh, uh, related. The church is... The lamp stands. That's an integral part of the temple. This is a continued description of the temple, of believers dwelling in the temple, as we saw in verse 1. So so it's of a piece, if you will. 
So, not two literal individuals who are to come, but symbolic of Christians generally. As Proverbs 16, 15 says, in the light of a king's face is life. If this is true of earthly kings, how much more with we who are spiritual kings and priests. The olive trees uh, probably come from Zechariah 4, which describe a king and a priest. So remember, Revelation 1, 5 and 5, 10, we're a kingdom and priest. And this is probably talking about the nature of, of the church here as a kingdom and priests as well. The light of God's presence in us can be seen by the world and become life to the world when we suffer, but do not lose hope. That the two witnesses of the worldwide church is clear not only because the lampstands symbolize churches in chapter 1, but because verse 9 says the whole world looks upon their bodies at the same time. Now some who take it literally see this as sort of worldwide, everybody can see these two individuals suffering worldwide because of television technology. Um, But if you don't import that into it, how do you deal with it? Well, I think everybody sees them around the world because it's the worldwide church, not two individuals. And notice what verse 10 says, and those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and make merry. They'll send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. Christmas has not been long past. Uh, I actually saw this on a Christmas card. Uh, this particular verse, talking about a, taking a verse out of context. Um, but anything to sell a card, I guess. Um, but be careful if you see that card. Look at the context. Um, when verse 7 says the beast will make war with the witnesses, look at that. In verse 7, when they finish their testimony, the beast that comes out of the abyss will make war with them and overcome them and kill them. Well, what's that about? Well, that, and it's acknowledged by virtually all commentators, is from Daniel 7, 21. If my wife were here, she would say, so what difference does that make? Tell me why that makes a difference. Because Daniel 7, 21 is talking about at the end of time, the uh, uh, enemy forces, those antagonistic to God, will not come against just two or three individuals, but will come against the saints, the corporate believing community on earth. So that further, I think, enforces the notion. We're not talking about just two individuals. We're talking about the community of faith on the earth. Um, And even the number two is symbolic. Uh, As as we said, there were only two faithful churches. Two was the number of witnesses in the Old Testament as well. Two witnesses were needed to provide evidence for judgment, and we'll see that that is in mind here. The faithful church will provide evidence at the end of time for the judgment of the ungodly by testifying the ungodly had rejected their witness to Christ. But how are we empowered to be a witness according to this passage, especially in the midst of suffering? Well, verses 3 to 4 continue to tell us, and especially verse 4, notice These are the ones, these are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. God's presence. We're standing before God's very presence. In the Old Testament, the priest stood before his presence. Now we are all priests, and we're standing before his presence, and it's that presence, the light of that presence, that uh, uh, gives us boldness to be a witness to him. It's not us. It's the light, the gracious light of God's presence. Only his presence can spur us on to continue to testify him in the midst of suffering like Polycarp. That's what enables us to continue to be a witness. The lampstands are continually standing before the Lord. Remember the lampstands in the temple were right outside the Holy of Holies where God's presence was. They represented God's presence. By the way, look at Revelation 4, 5 with me. Um, In chapter 4, in verse 5, we have a vision before the throne. It says, From the throne proceed flashes of lightning, and sounds and peals of thunder, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. What's well, interesting? The seven lamps burning before the throne are the seven spirits of God. They're, they're the Holy Spirit. Now, what do you do with lamps? Well, according to Zechariah 4, the lamps in, in Exodus are on the lampstand. So we, we don't burn from our own power. It is the Holy Spirit that energizes us and causes us to be zealous and to burn for the Lord Jesus in witness. 
So verses 5 to 6 then say our witness in the midst of suffering is that of like, that like uh, Moses and Elijah's. Notice verse 5. If anyone desires to harm them, fire proceeds out of their mouth and devours their enemies. And if anyone uh, would desire to harm them in this manner, he must be killed. These have the power to shut up the sky in order that rain may fall during the days of their prophesying. And they have power over the waters to turn them into blood and to smite the earth with every plague as often as they desire. What is this talking about? Are we talking about, uh, again, literal two individuals and there's this flamethrower coming out of the mouth and it's just a supernatural thing? Um, Well, if that's what the text is saying, we want to believe that. Uh, I don't think, as I've said, these are two individuals. So how do we take the ministry of these people? Um, well, Second Kings 1.10 affirms that when soldiers of the evil king of Israel tried to capture Elijah, God sent fire from heaven and it killed them. Is this literal like that? I think that is in mine, but now I think uh, this, this becomes spiritual. It's symbolic. But of what is it symbolic? And why would I say it's symbolic? Let's let Scripture interpret Scripture. Okay, I mean, this is, this is my view uh, as much as I can. I may be sometimes be certainly wrong in it. Uh, we're all fallible interpreters. But whenever you have the phrase proceeding out of the mouth, that five-word phrase, in Greek and in English, in the book of Revelation, it's never talking about something literal coming out of the mouth. It's always figurative. Let me give you examples. In Revelation 16, 13, frogs proceed out of the mouths of the evil demonic beings, and the frogs result in deceiving people. So the frogs coming out of the mouth of these beings are symbolic. I mean, they're not, I mean, you've you got to take that symbolically, otherwise you have a very bizarre sci-fi <laughs> view. Uh, this guy's, well, we just had breakfast, but at any rate. Um, <laughs> And, and, and then in chapter 1 and verse 16 and chapter 19 and 15 and implicit elsewhere, a sword, do you remember, proceeds out of the mouth of Christ. Well, is he, I mean, is this literally kind of doing battle with a sword coming out of his mouth in a very literal way? I don't think so. Uh, the sword is an image of judgment. And uh, so this is symbolic. This is symbolic of judgment, in other words. And uh, so... Uh, we, we let the phrase proceeding out of the mouth, uh, we, we try to understand it. It's always figurative. Likely it is figurative here too, especially since we're going to see that the witnesses' lives are a replica of Christ's life. We'll see that in a moment. The pattern of their life is based on Christ's life. So the fire proceeding from the witnesses' mouths, consuming unbelievers, is our witness which is pronounced by our mouth, which will destroy unbelievers by being evidence at the last judgment that they rejected our witness. The ungodly are already judged in the present when they become intractable and they reject our witness if they stay uh, in that unbelieving stance until they die. They're already judged then. Verse 6 further describes our prophetic authority in witnessing as being generally like that of Moses and Elijah. Now remember that Elijah prophesied it would not rain for three and a half years, and it didn't. Moses prophesied the, word, uh, the, the, the rivers, river Egypt would turn into blood, and it did. And the reason they both had their ministry is because of evil kings uh, that they were uh, witnessing to uh, who rejected their testimony. Now we as Christians have the same stance, not with the same literal miraculous power, but a similar power in our word of witness, which is a supernatural power. Remember that so far, most of verses 1 through 5 have been symbolic. So how about these plagues? You see that phrase there at the end? Uh, These witnesses will smite them with every plague. What is that? Well, I think uh, probably the best way to understand it is to look at the word plague in the book of Revelation. How is it used? Remember the very end of the book, chapter 22, verse 18? which says this. I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues which are written in this book. And some of those plagues are the plagues coming from the two witnesses. Now, this is startling. This is not a plague reserved for someone in the yet future time 
of a tribulation that hasn't happened yet. It will apply to that, but it also applies to today. In fact, it applies to the first century believers or pseudo-believers. Those who claim to be believers but uh, go over to the side of false teaching, uh, verse 18 says, they will actually, in the first century, experience the plagues. So it's not just the plague of eternal suffering and hell. It's leading to that. But these are plagues during the, uh, the church age. And, uh, and I think chapter 22, verse 18, makes that clear. Again, showing the present relevance of our passage. Letting scripture interpret the scripture. Now, our lives are to be patterned then after Moses and Elijah. But how so? Both of these great prophets were rejected by unbelievers because of their message, and they suffered. But because God's presence was empowering them, they were enabled to persevere in their prophetic witness and were encouraged not to despair. Doesn't mean they didn't get depressed. Remember Elijah? Lord, it's enough now. Take my life. I mean, he got pretty depressed. So, I mean, we certainly have our ups and our downs. But that we're a replica of Christ's life. And this is why he says in chapter 14 and verse 4, John does, we follow the lamb wherever he goes. Listen to the replica here. Uh, the pattern of Christ's life. He was a faithful witness, a light to the world. Revelation 1.5 says that. And then, of course, we have witness in our passage. And Antipas, the faithful witness in chapter 2. This witness of Christ lasted roughly three and a half years. So does the witness in chapter 11. Resulted in satanic opposition and suffering, thirdly. Fourthly, ended in violent death. Fifth, people rejoiced both over Christ and over the church's demise, and finally vindication through resurrection. As the passage was read, we won't have time to look at it because I wanted to focus on 1 to 7 today, but they're vindicated by resurrection. And uh, what that means is they become even more like Christ. That is, they become raised as he was raised to identify with him, and that is their reward. So verses 1 to 6 are saying God's presence with us protects us spiritually to empower our witness to the world. Do we we get depressed over our circumstances when they're bad? Sometimes we do. We need to trust in the Lord and draw near to his word when that happens. We may be going through hard times because our witness has been rejected. Or other forms of suffering. Remember, things may come upon us, whether it's an illness, whatever it may be, loss of a job, due to no one's fault necessarily, perhaps. And how we respond to those situations, which are not seen as overt persecution, is a witness. And we need to remember that. We're going to bring every thought captive to the thinking of Jesus. There's no part of our life that's not related ultimately to our faith and to our witness. At other times we suffer. Well, it's like Job, you know. I mean, Satan took his family, and Job responds, Naked I came from the womb, naked I'll return. The Lord gives, the Lord's taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Then God strikes his body. He responds even when his wife tells him to curse God and die. Shall we accept good from God and not also evil. And in this, Job did not sin, the text says. Death is a tragedy that touches all of us. Most of us have known people close to us who have died. Many unbelievers weep with no hope in such circumstances. What should our reaction be? Well, Paul says, remember in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13, about our loved ones who die in the Lord, do not grieve as those who have no hope. And what's interesting, most people don't Remember what the preceding verse says. It says that we're to behave properly toward outsiders. That's a witness, the way we respond to death. And, and it's, it's, it, the Puritans always pray, Lord, cause me to be a witness in my death. And we should be a witness in reacting to the death of others as well. So how would you answer my sister-in-law's question? I tried the best I could over the phone. It's very difficult, of course. I believe Revelation 11, 1 to 2 is a vital part of the answer. The physical part of our temples have not been measured or guaranteed by God to be protected, but he has guaranteed to protect us spiritually, to be in his presence, to stay in his presence. He may take away our physical comforts, but he will not take himself away from us. So practically, uh, three things here that uh, hopefully would comfort uh, my sister-in-law and us. We should be motivated each day to live into eternity because God has promised he'll always be with us. Remember Matthew 20, 8, 20. And by the way, that's a temple text. 
footnote my temple book on that, uh, and you can read about that. But it's not coincidental. We should enjoy God's presence through fellowshipping with him and his word and prayer. Secondly, each day we live, we get to know God, we get to know his love, and as we do get to know his love increasingly, how does that help us with regard to this fear that can paralyze us from suffering and maybe even the fear of death? Well, 1 John 4.18 says, Perfect love casts out fear. And the more we know and understand God's love, the less fear we will have. Thirdly, as we come increasingly to enjoy God, to know him better, trust his loving purposes for us, then we can trust him increasingly to guide us through each day that we live. At the end of time, Christ will vindicate our testimony and finally judge those who rejected it and vindicate us in resurrection, as I mentioned. So the main point of our passage this morning is that God's presence with us protects us spiritually to empower our witness in the world. It protects us through suffering. There's a book called The Persecutor. If you've never read it, you've got to go on uh, the Internet and find it by the used book. It's still out there. The Persecutor by Sergei Kortikov. It's an autobiography. He writes about his life when he was part of the KGB in the Soviet Union. He was the leader of a special squad when he was at the uh, equivalent of the Naval Academy uh, in the United States, the Russian Naval Academy. And uh, he was with some other athletes. They were friends. And one day somebody came and said, hey, how would you like to moonlight on the weekends and make some extra money? Say, hey, sounds good to me. It was a KGB agent. And uh, their role on the weekends was to go and bust up home churches, house churches of what they knew of as believers. And... Um, and so they did this, and uh, they went to one house church, and uh, they busted it up and would often physically harm people pretty badly. And Sergei Kortikov uh, noticed a, a young, beautiful uh, woman there, about 20 years old, and, and she got roughed up. A few months later, they go to another house church, busted up, hurt people, but there is the same young, pretty woman, and they're, they're irritated. And so they take turns spanking her, and I won't describe the rest of it, but spanked her until she was bleeding profusely. A few months later, they bust up another house church. And guess who's there? Same young woman. One of his colleagues is about to give her a very, perhaps, lethal blow, and Sergei Kortikov says, don't do that. She's got more courage than we do. She's got something. I don't know what it is. She's got something. Leave her alone. Well, he went through a long pilgrimage before he became a Christian, but when he finally came to Christ, he remembered that it was her witness through suffering and her courage that caused him to take a second look at what might have been causing her to act so stupidly from his perspective. And this launched him in the direction of believing in Christ. He concludes his autobiography in gratitude to this brave Christian girl, he says, and finally to Natasha, whom I beat terribly and who was willing to be beaten a third time for her faith. I want to say, Natasha, largely because of you, my life has now changed. I'm a fellow believer in Christ with you. I have a new life before me. God has forgiven me. I hope you can also. Thank you, Natasha, wherever you are. I will never, never forget you. She was a priest offering herself boldly because of the presence of God that she was convinced of. And it made an impact on him, and he became a witness to others. He was convinced. He, he jumped overboard from a spy ship and went to Canada. He was convinced he'd be killed. About a year after writing the book, he was shot with a rifle while he was skiing somewhere in California. But Natasha was a priest. God's presence with us protects us spiritually through suffering to empower our proclamation to the world. And this is uh, nothing more than what the uh, Heidelberg Catechism tells us. You remember uh, the first question? What is our only comfort in life and death, that I with body and soul, both in life and death, and not my own, but belong to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ, who with his precious blood is fully satisfied for all my sins, delivered me from the power of the devil, and so preserves me, that without the will of my heavenly Father, not a hair can fall from my head. Yea, that all things must be subservient to my salvation, and 
Therefore, by his Holy Spirit, he also assures me of eternal life and makes me sincerely willing and ready henceforth to live with him. Let's pray. Father, give us grace to know you're abiding with us as we identify with Christ, the temple, and cause us to be bold, knowing your presence is with us to witness. For your glory we pray. Amen.